Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege for sure to be one of the Lord Jesus' servant and at the same time be able to worship with you, the same Christ and Savior without whom we would be nothing. We, we, we can do nothing. We can achieve nothing. We can see nothing. We can, I would say, uh, that I'm a man of God, it's because of his grace and mercy. I haven't chosen him, but he did. There was nothing great in me. There is nothing great in me apart from the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, I don't know how aware are you of what are things happening in India, but thank you for standing with us and praying for us. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, David. Uh, just uh, a week back, one of our student, Bible college student, he was even back home, and uh, his father has a small shop, and people came and burned his shop in the middle of the night, just because uh, they are Christians. And uh, so a lot of things are happening. We have many families in the church, many women in the church uh, who have been abandoned by their husbands just because these women have started believing in the Lord. They have been kicked out of the families and the houses, but they have eternal house which they still cling on to, the hope that they have in Christ Jesus. And uh, so when the world promises everything and sometimes the prosperity doctrine promises everything, and we see this in the face of what we are going through right now in India, we realize what heaven has promised to us, what God has promised to us, is far more desirable than anything this world can promise. There's so much of joy and peace in Christ Jesus, regardless of what you possess, or regardless of what you have lost. Because there's one thing that can never be lost, and that is you and your communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. And even your salvation. What a joy it is. Three of our young people were called. A phone call came to three of our students, and they went to visit a family. So three of my students were called by somebody in the village and said, we are sick, can you come and pray for us? And these three decided to go. And the, the neighbor called the police and put them behind bars for some time. Then we had to rush in and we told them there's nothing wrong that they were doing. No, they blamed them to be converting the Hindus into Christians. And we said, no, they called us for prayer. There is a, this is the call that they, we received. And that's why we just come for prayer. But, you know, when the whole system is against you, then uh, they have their own ways. So they were put behind bars and we brought them out after some efforts. But then they had to go through court cases for six months. But praise God that they are out now. So keep us in prayer. Keep, uh, keep India and everything that is happening in our churches and in prayer. But at the same time, I would, I would uh, encourage you to pray for our nation because we're having a lot of souls, a lot of people coming to the Lord. And that's the reason a lot of people are annoyed with Christianity because uh, somehow, in spite of all that, every week we have people, the new people coming and seeking Jesus. Every, every week we have new att attendees in the church. So praise God for that. Uh, in the last uh, two years of COVID, this is the third year, uh, in last two years of COVID, we are able to plant 12 congregations by God's grace in the last two years of COVID. Uh, and the way it happened was uh, we divided our church with few people coming from different directions then we ask a young man to go and start a church in that direction, in that area. And uh, praise God that we succeeded in planting these 12 congregations in our city. And uh, there's another city uh, that we have, we have churches in. So right now we are 172 churches planted by 
one congregation by the help and the grace of the Lord Jesus. And uh, our target is 1,000. I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't want to die before I see 1,000 churches being planted and 1,000 young men being trained and sent into mission field. So we have reached 172 by the grace of the Lord. So please keep us in prayer. Now, it's not that I have to achieve all that target. I have to do all of those things. But I want to see. I want to see 1,000 churches being planted. I want to see 1,000 young men being trained to pastor churches and to plant congregations. And that's my desire. And I, I, I pray that God would uh, make that happen. My family is safe. We all went through difficult situation through COVID. Uh, I don't know if you have read in the news uh, in, nine, in 2021, April and May, it was a very difficult time for India. Uh, just in my city, there were approximately 400 people dying every day, just in my city. In my campus, many people died. Uh, we were praying in the church that you said, Lord, we all want to go through this and be victorious. Till you tarry, we want to have church witness in this city, so help us. And praise God, we went through all kinds of situations. My wife was sick, my children were sick, but we all came out of it fine, safe. Out of 600 of those people that God has given to us in the church, there was not even one death. I thank God for that. Uh, even if they would die, they would be with the Lord, but thank God that God has given them another year, years to proclaim his majesty and proclaim his word. So I thank God for that. We are alive because there is a purpose. We are alive. We live not because of us or for us, but we live because of him and for him. As Colossians chapter 1 says that everything that we see or don't see, seen or unseen, heavenly principalities or whatever uh, that is on the face of the earth is by the Lord and for the Lord, and to him be glory, Romans 11. So, this morning I would like to share with you uh, a scripture from Acts chapter 1. And uh, we'll start reading from verses uh, 1 onward, Acts chapter 1. And says in uh, verses 1 onwards, I would read, In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, and after he had been given commands through the Holy Spirit to apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. By many proofs, he presented himself alive. By many proofs, not just few appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So now we know that Jesus has given them enough proofs, many infallible proofs. And then he says, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, the same Jerusalem that crucified Jesus, same Jerusalem for whom, for which city Jesus said, I wish that you would be under my wings, but you rejected. The same city which is going to receive the judgment of God, Jesus said, I want you to remain in the city. Why? Because there is a purpose. I have chosen something. There, was, there would be a gathering after, 40, after 50, 50 days, there would be a gathering of people from all over the world. And it's a strategic place. I have a plan and a purpose, and I want you to remain that, in that city. Sometimes when God keeps us in a place which seems to be a difficult place, which seems to be a troubled place, which seems to be a place of writing and uh, difficulty, let me tell you, there still is a plan of God. Stay there because there, from there, God is going to use us. And that's why he said, stay in that city. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, 7, and 8. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, uh, all the Jews were expecting a Messiah who's going to be a, a ruler, a king, a mighty warrior. He's going to liberate them from the tyranny of Rome. 
That's what they were expecting and they didn't know that Jesus has greater plan and he has come to crush the, the greater enemy, the sin. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And I praise God that Father has fixed by his own authority. And then he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when you have a lot of proofs and many infallible proofs, when you have, what else it takes to be a witness? A witness knows, right? A witness has information. A witness has seen. Why do you need power to be a witness? What does power have to do with being a witness? You need proofs, right? When the judge asks you, have you seen that? And you say, yes, I've seen that. I have seen the resurrection of Jesus. I've seen the crucifixion of Jesus. I have seen the power of Jesus Christ. That's all I need to tell people. And Bible says, these are the people who have seen Christ. These are the people who have seen the glory of Christ. They have seen the miracles. They have seen signs and wonders. They have seen the power of God manifested. They also have seen the crucifixion. They have seen the purity and the piety of Jesus Christ the Lord. They have also seen the resurrection. When in spite of all of these things, he said, you have seen. Now you have many infallible proofs. I have told you everything. You have information and facts. He said, still wait. Still wait. Why? You need power. Now before... I get into what kind of power that he, he wanted to give to his disciple. I would like to say what he's not talking about. Sometimes when, when I, as a Pentecostal, as a, as a charismatic, I will say, I, you know, I pastor a, ch a charismatic church, which is a church with a seat belt on. Charismatic with seat belt on. <laughs> so when I pastor that church, most of the time I've heard it's about uh, the power to perform wonders and miracles, signs and wonders. And I would say, yes, God's power is needed for that too. But he was not talking about that power. He was not talking about power to perform signs and wonders, miraculous signs. Why would I say that? Because when we turn to Mark chapter 9, let's turn to Mark chapter 9 real quick. Book of Mark in chapter 9 and verses 30, uh, 38 onwards. It says, and John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us. And we forbade him because he follows not us. Let me read an ESV translation. It says, John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Now, Jesus said, do not stop him. When we read in other places, we, find, we see that John asking him to come along and be with Jesus. Come along and become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what who we are. You also come and join us. And then he says, but Jesus, uh, uh, because he was not following us, he doesn't want us. To be with us, he doesn't want to be part of your congregation or your discipleship group or a part of us. He chose not to because it's very clear. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be soon ab afterward able to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us, truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So what we see is someone casting out demons in the name of Jesus and Jesus clearly says no one no one who does a mighty work in my name. So Jesus realized that casting out the demon is a mighty work and still somebody who is not ready to follow Jesus could perform it. Somebody who's not willing to follow Jesus, somebody who's not willing to be one of his disciples, somebody who's not willing to follow John to be with Jesus, still able to perform a mighty work. Jesus calls it a mighty work. 
And Jesus says that no one can do a mighty work in my name and be soon afterward able to speak evil of me. So what I see is, in the name of Jesus, mighty works do happen even when the person is not filled with the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I used to think that power to perform wonders and miracles and mighty works is what he's talking about. And when I go back to Mark, I realize that there are mighty works happening in the name of Jesus. Now, if you come to India, I'm telling you, there would be no village where you would not hear of the testimony of mighty works performed by Jesus or in the name of Jesus. But those people, they're not even disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a kind of a Christian uh, witchcraft. In the, I would not say Christian witchcraft, but Christ, witchcraft happening kind of witchcraft in the name of Jesus. Because they have realized there is power in the name of Jesus. So they call upon the name of Jesus and they sell this power for thousand bucks, five thousand rupees. I'm not kidding. People, people are called to perform some wonders in the name of Jesus and they say, we'll give you five thousand rupees. And that pastor will say, no, 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 no. I charge 8,000 to come to your house and cast this demon out. This is happening in India. Can I deny that there is no power when somebody calls on the name of the Lord Jesus? Or should I say only somebody who is greatly filled with the Holy Spirit, rightly walking with the Lord, can perform wonders and mighty works? No. God said to Moses, talk to the stone, rock. Talk to the rock and the rock will give you water. Moses went and hid the rock. And yet the water gushed out. Because Moses was right, right? No. He didn't do what he was expected to do. Yet a miracle, a sign, a wonder was performed. Why? Because of the mercy and the grace of God upon the thirsty people and upon the life of Moses. They would have stoned him to death. If in spite of all of these, if suppose Moses goes, the Lord said, go and talk to the rock. And Moses goes out of his anger. He hits the rock. And water doesn't gush out. What would happen? Moses' life would be in danger. Because they wanted to kill Moses. And that's why water gushed out. Sometimes these signs and wonders are happening because of the mercy and the grace of God, not that the man is upright. That this man is justified before God, everything that he does is fine, is right, is accepted by God. No, these signs and wonders sometimes happen just because of the mercy and the grace of God and somebody called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we know in, Acts, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent his disciples two by one, two by two, and they came back after praying for the sick and casting the demon out. And they said, Lord, in your name, even the demons are subject to us. Remember, in your name. The demons are subject to us. Why is now Jesus saying when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will receive power? Because I see power exhibited even by apostles before being filled with the Holy Spirit even. The Holy Spirit was with them according to John chapter 14. The Spirit is with you but he's going to be in you. A few things that I would like you to note. Number one. Three things, in fact. What he says here is you will receive power. These are the people who want God's kingdom to be established, but in their own explanation, in their own, I would say, uh, in their own idea, they had a, a, a geographical kingdom in mind, a kingdom that was limited to the redemption of Israel from Rome. But Jesus had something greater in mind. And he said, you want kingdom to be established, you want kingdom to come, but I want you to become partner in those 
partner among partner with me as I establish my kingdom because it's God alone who establishes his kingdom. I don't establish his kingdom. He establishes his kingdom. Isaiah chapter 9 is very clear. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And this will be done because of the zeal of the Lord. It's not because I'm ready to establish the kingdom and the kingdom is established. But God is saying, you don't have to wait for that establishment of the kingdom. I want you to do partner with me. I want you to be used in that. And for that, what you need is the Holy Spirit. What you need is the Holy Spirit. Three things I would, I would, uh, I would desire that uh, we, we give heed to. He says, you will receive power. When he says, you will receive power, why? Now, God is self-sufficient and self-reliant. He is not relying on any one of us. He is not looking at me and says, Michael, without you, I can't do it. He can do all by himself. Acts chapter 17 is very clear. He does not need the service of our hands as if he needed it. He does not take the service of our hands as if he needed it. He doesn't need anything. He has been complete. He is complete and he would always be a complete God who does not lack anything. Does not lack anything. So if God does not need me, why? He is saying, you will receive power. It's because we are his body. What a great joy it is to be body of Christ. We get to partner with Jesus Christ in the salvation of souls. It's not that I'm not changing anybody's heart. Somebody asked me, how many souls have you saved? I said, not even mine. I needed Jesus for that. And if you think you can save somebody's soul, if you think you can change somebody's mind, Try on your wife or your husband. I also said, or your husband. Try on anybody. You would be a utterl, utterly, you know, a, a failed guy. You would never be able to change anybody's mind. In fact, I am not able to change my mind. I have to trust God to do it. So when he says you will receive power is, that doesn't mean, okay, I have given you power, I stay secluded, now you perform it for me. Now you do it for me. It's, it doesn't happen that way. Why I can say that? Because in this third chapter, when a, a, a wonder, a sign, a miracle has been performed in the life of that uh, lame guy at the, at the temple, it's Acts chapter 3 and verse 12 when everyone started rushing in, when everyone started running to Peter and says, Peter, you performed a great wonder. John, you performed a great wonder. You know what Peter says? Why do you look to us as if we have done it by own power and piety? So Peter knows and he declares in Acts chapter 3, 12, that it's not because of my power. But in the first chapter, it says you will receive power. Yes, remember this, my power is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the person of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is with me, I have power. It's not that take power, now you don't need me anymore, you are powerful. It doesn't happen this way. Christian ministry doesn't happen this way. My power is in the person of the Holy Spirit. If I do not depend on the Holy Spirit for anything and everything, nothing is going to be achieved. Nothing good can come out of my labor. Nothing good can come out of my trying and whining and working unless the Holy Spirit is at work. So I can never say I have power. Now Holy Spirit, watch me. I am going to establish the churches. Holy Spirit, you just sit and watch. No, I have to be totally dependent every day, every hour, and I would say every moment of my life upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has not been given to me just to give me power and then stand aloof and wait for me to perform. I thank God that this is not the case. 
Otherwise, I would have, or you would have failed in anything and everything. I thank God that Holy Spirit is with us. And he would never depart from us. Never. Even in my failure, he keeps holding on to my hands. Psalm 37 and verse 23 is very clear. Even when I fall, you keep holding my hands. So this, uh, this fear of losing Holy Spirit uh, so that you don't have power, I'm please get out of that fear. Let that fear never be part of you. Because he has chosen you to be with you and to be yours and you be his forever. And he's not going to change his mind. He says, you, God being self-sufficient, self-reliant, he doesn't need me and still says, Michael, you will be filled with power. And that power is in the Holy Spirit. Continual presence and working of the Holy Spirit. When we turn to Exodus chapter 4, let's go to Exodus chapter 4. I don't know how long do I have, but blessed are those who speak short, they will be called again. You don't know that scripture? Every congregation needs that scripture, warns that scripture. Okay, it's chapter 4 and verses 1 onwards. It says, when Mo then Moses answered, behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. Now, all these things happen, and then we come to uh, these three signs that, that God has already given to him. And then verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and of tongue. It means my... Uh, my deficiency, my weaknesses are still there in spite of the great experience that I have with you. Now Moses saw the burning bush. He stood in the most holy place and still has an impediment. Still has a weakness. Still has some issues in his body. In spite of all that he has gone through, in spite of all that he has witnessed, in spite of all that he has heard, in spite of standing in, right in the presence of God, which is the most holy place. And says, I am a man of uh, stammering lips. Either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I the Lord? Hmm. When I had not read that scripture, I, I, I would always say, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? I would say the devil right away. But then the scripture says, is it not I, the Lord? Then he says, now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Now why did he say, I will be with your mouth? Why did he say, I will be with you? He could have said, "My Moses, I have given you the strength. Go and perform it for me. Go and do it for me. Go, do something for the kingdom of God. Do something for God. He's saying, no, I will be with you. Why? Because what Moses wanted, ability to do things for God, whereas God, what God wanted him in him is, that God would be his ability, that God would be his strength, God would be his might, and forever together with God, he would be able to see those things happening. And same with us. There will be so many weaknesses that we might see in our own selves. But let me tell you, my strength does not lie in me. My strength lies in the person of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. My strength might not be seen in my body. You might not see power in anything that I do. Or, but 
you'll see power in the person of the Holy Spirit when the person of the Holy Spirit works with me. And that is why here he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. What is that power? That power is God himself being with us, working in us and working through us, working for us. The name of my power is Jesus Christ the Lord. The Lord himself is our strength. I don't receive anything from God apart from God. I receive God and that, that is my strength. That's my glory. That's my joy. That's my everything. I receive God. So he says, you shall be witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Another thing is, he says, receive. You shall receive power. He didn't say you will earn power. He didn't say you'll have to work for it. He didn't say you'll have to you be in the fasting for 10 days or, or, or anything. He said you shall receive power. We don't earn the power of God. We do receive the power of God. It has been granted unto us to believe and to suffer for his name's sake. Philippians chapter 1 and 29. Acts chapter 14 also says this. They, they, they went out and preached the gospel. And God granted that the signs and wonders would be performed. The word granted again is gave. It is a gift of God. So when, God's, when Jesus was saying, you shall receive power, he didn't say, by your own strength or by your own working, by your own anything, you are going to earn that power. And many times you hear this, this phrase, salvation is free, but the anointing is costly. No matter what cost had to be paid, Jesus paid that cost. And I receive it as a gift. I receive it as something that my father willingly wants to give to me so that I can live a life pleasing to him and blessing others. Everything that pertains to righteousness and godliness, everything that I need for my salvation has been given to me, granted unto me, given as a gift. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to work for it. I have to receive it by faith. And that's why they had to wait. They had to wait and receive. Power is in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is that power? In fact, what that power will do in us when we are filled with that power? Was it signs and wonders? Signs and wonders happening in the name of Jesus Christ. Even those who do not lead a life led by the Holy Spirit. There's still signs and wonders happening in those lives. So which power is he talking about? We'll, for a brief moment, we'll talk about that. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 to 31, he says, He gives strength to the weak. He empowers the weak. He gives strength. So God is a God who loves to give power to his people. Then Psalm 84 and verse uh, 5 to 7 talks about those who dwell in the house of the Lord, they receive power from God. So God is a God who wants to give his power to, to, to his people. But the way he does is by in the person of the Holy Spirit. That God alone becomes my power. If you want to achieve it, it a certain thing that God has in mind for his glory alone, all that you can do is you trust God, Receive his power and you'll be able to see that that happened. You can achieve that, whatever God has in mind. Now when we turn to Psalm 84 and verses 5 to 7, let's turn to Psalm 84 and verses 5 to 7. It says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it pool, with pools. They go from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength till each one appears before God in Zion. What power is he talking about? What strength is he talking about? He's talking about the strength 
to persevere in the difficult times. As we go through the Valley of Baca, he talks about the strength to persevere till we appear before God in Zion. What is he talking about? What power that he's talking about? Ability to persevere in difficult times. And that's what he said, you shall be my witnesses. The word witnesses is martyr. Now it doesn't mean that everyone has to die for God because Acts, uh, Revelation chapter 6, there is a number, certain number of people who would be killed for the faith. Everyone doesn't have to die. But why everyone has to be a witness? And it's the same word for martyr. But in Acts chapter 1 only, when he, when, when he says, okay, Judas has hanged himself, so somebody should become witness along with us. It's the same word. That doesn't mean he's going to die or he has to die, but that witness is what I have seen, what I have heard, what I have witnessed, I'm going to proclaim that even to the point of death. The power to stand firm in difficult times comes only from the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders can be performed, but the power to stand firm in the midst of difficulties comes from the Holy Spirit. I remember a time when, I don't know if I've shared this testimony with you or not, but two, three times I have gone through a very dangerous situation. Uh, one was a young man got water baptized. I, I, I baptized him. His father came to know that his son has been baptized. And uh, the whole family didn't believe in the Lord. They never heard of the Lord. They didn't believe in the Lord. The son got baptized. And father came to know that he has been baptized. So father was mad at me and he loaded his revolver and he was coming to my house to shoot me. So his son calls me up and says, Pastor, you better run away from your house because my father is mad at you and he's coming to shoot you. I said, okay, if I run away today, I'll have to run again tomorrow because that's my house. Now in India, buying a house or having a house is a huge big blessing. It's one of the biggest blessings that you can have, that you have your own house. And my father, we, my father built a house, so we live in that house. I said, if I li leave this house, where would I go? It's not like America. You can move anywhere and you know, it doesn't happen like that. It's like for us, moving from one place to another would take a huge, big, challenging decision. I need to be very rich to be able to do it. Or I need to have a very, very paying job, highly paid job in order to do that. So when this was happening, he said, run away from your house because my father is mad. His father was working in Air Force and he had a licensed revolver. And he was a, a, a man who used to be very angry. He, I said, no, I cannot run away because this is my house. If he comes again tomorrow, where will I go? He said, pastor, you don't know my father. I said, yeah, that's right. I don't know your father, but you also don't know my father. You have just begun to know him. Uh, he said, no, pastor, it's not a time to joke. When we were young, when I was 13 year old, he would hang me upside down. and beat us up with rod when we were 13 years old. So please run away. I was scared, really scared, <laughs> but I decided not to run away. I don't know what happened. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a very bold guy, very powerful, you know, I can face anything. But all of a sudden, the strength came. I said, I'm not running anywhere. I will be staying. His father was supposed to come in 10, 12 minutes. Because it's a straight road from his house to my house, only five miles or so. And 10 minutes passed, nobody came. 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And 30 minutes passed, he calls me up again. And he says, Pastor, are you there? I said, yeah, it's me. It's not my ghost. <laughs> he said, my, where is my father? I said, I don't know. Where is he? He said, has he not reached you? He said, no. Oh, 
run away. God is giving you another opportunity, another chance to save yourself. His name is Arvind. I said, Arvind, I don't know. I don't need to run away, but uh, thank you for your concern, but I don't need to. He said, Pastor, God is giving you opportunity. I know my father. I said, no, it's okay. Then after some time, he calls me up again. He says, are you there? I said, yes. Where's my father? I said, don't blame me. He's not here. <laughs> I don't know where he is. So almost after an hour or so, he calls me up again. He says, little more than an hour. He says, my father has come back. And he threw himself on a sofa, a couch, and he's not talking to anybody. He's all pale, yellowish, and he's not talking to anyone. He's very different to look at. I have never seen my father in that way. I said, don't mess up with your father. Don't talk to him. Let your mama do all the talking. <laughs> because mamas can handle all kind of, you know, situations. So let your mama do the talking. After some, some talking, he came to me and said, my father gave a story to my mama. He says, when he was on the way, he heard a voice. Don't touch my people. Don't touch my people. And he was forced to turn right and stand next to a crossing for one hour almost. And I thank God that God protected me. Now I'm not talking about the power to change his mind. That was not mine. But the power that the Holy Spirit gave me was to stand in the midst of difficulties. The same Peter who was so afraid in confronting people and teaching them about sin and righteousness. Same Peter who denied Jesus three times was able to preach the most thought-provoking and heart-wrenching and pricking message. He said, you have crucified the Lord. And the Lord has raised him up and he is the Lord and Savior. You have crucified him. It means accusing them and putting blame on them for crucifying Jesus. The, the message that would make many mad. But he was able to preach that message. Why? Who gave you that power? Oh, Holy Spirit. And that's why that, be, that message became the part of the scripture because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you power to confront the sinners. Sometimes even in the families, we see sin happening and we don't even have power to confront it. Young people, you might go through some peer pressure situations. You might see your own brother slipping into some kind of sin. And you don't have any power to stand against that. You have no power to talk to that person. And I pray you need Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying you go to every sinner and say, this is your sin, that is your sin, this is your sin, and that is your sin. What I'm saying is, what about your own brother? What about your own sister? What about somebody who's working next to you? What about somebody who's living next to you? Do you have no responsibility telling them that Jesus alone is the Savior and this road leads to hell? But I have a way, and his name is Jesus, that leads to heaven. It will only happen with the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus was saying you need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to receive the power. It was the power to confront sin. It was power to stand in the midst of difficulties and be able to preach the gospel. It was power to overcome every fear of being ostracized by the society. What will happen to me if I talk to my my friend about the sin that they might be involved in. I would not be their friends anymore. What would happen if I talk to my wife about something wrong that is happening in the house? What, what would happen if I tell my husband, this is not right, this is not justified? And sometimes Ananiah and Sapphira happens because of this. 
Because we don't have strength enough to stand against the evil in the house and in the family, in the church. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if you have witnessed that or not, but I've, I, I, because I pastor, uh, I, I pastor for almost 34 years and I have uh, 740 churches to oversee, 172 that we have planted by God's grace. I have come across many such situations where there is sin in the church and it goes under the couch. It goes under the rug. There's nobody with, who confronts that. There is sin in the family and nobody confronts that. Nobody has power enough to stand against what is evil and to say. And it's not that you have to be, you know, full of hatred to do that. With love you do it. With, with genuineness of heart you do it. Because you don't want your brother and your sister to perish. Which power is God talking about? That you will receive power that you, to, you, to be able to speak the truth in love. To be able to stand against those who are the adversaries of the gospel. And preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One last thing and I'll, I think I should finish the... the I don't, is it okay? Okay. <laughs> no, it's not for that. Okay. It's uh, uh, Philippians, book of Philippians. Let's, let's turn to book of Philippians in chapter 4. How many times in the youth camps we have heard this word, this scripture being preached. I have preached it many a times and uh, I am... You know, I would confess many times I really did not look into the context of the scripture and I preached like a charismatic preacher. You know, I can do all things. Come on, you can be David killing Goliath. You can be Samson, you know, uh, taking a jawbone and killing thousand with jawbone. But let me, let's talk about this strength, this power that God gives to his people. This is, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that I now, uh, verses 10 onwards, I'm sorry. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 10. I can do all things. I mean 10 onwards. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern. From, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me. But you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking or being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What strength is he talking about? Was he talking about killing Goliath, the strength that kills Goliath? The power that kills the enemy? No, he was talking about him being rejected, him not being taken care of by the church in the Macedonian region. Now in the Macedonian region, church of Philippi used to help him. And now Paul is in prison. The whole book of Philippi has been written from Paul being in the prison. Lock up for two years. I don't know for what happened after that, how many years it, it went on, but at least for two years, that's what Acts chapter 28 talks about. And he was in need of certain things. He was in need of uh, basic amenities. He was in need of food. He was in need of clothing. And that's why he writes to Timothy and says, when you come, bring this and that and this and that. Because I need. Come before winter. Everyone has deserted me. I need some help. I need people to serve me. Now, different times when Paul was in this kind of situation. Now, nobody took care Nobody really uh, served him. Verse 14 onwards, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. So what he calls that situation is a troublesome situation. Listen, and you Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. So the only one church that partnered with Paul in this work of ministry and helped him in times of need was the Philippian church. And now for a long time when Paul is in prison, he's writing that you did not care for me enough, but I'm not accusing you for that. 
because maybe you didn't have the opportunity. But at last, now your concern has been revived for me. You have started taking care of me. You started giving me my needs. You have started supplying my needs and helping me in, in, in different things. He's saying, but all along, God was strengthening me. God was giving me power to do what? To be in any situation and ever rejoicing in who Christ is. He says, I can do all things. I can go through this time of loneliness. I can go through this time of not being taken care of. Friends, it would happen in your life too. Sometimes you would have complaints against people. She didn't take care of me. My daddy didn't love me enough. He didn't give me that much money. Otherwise, I would have also done this course and that course. But in all of these situations, the Lord himself will give you strength. Not just to be sustained in that situation, but, if, but be full of hope and joy in the midst of lack and difficulties. In the midst of trouble, Paul calls those things trouble. In my trouble, you partner with me in those days. But in this time, you left me, deserted me. You need the strength of God. If, you, if, if there are situations that you're going through, and if there are situations that make you question somebody else's love for you, I pray that you receive the strength from the Holy Spirit. And you say, God, I can do it. I can go through this. I can reach my destiny. Whatever you have planned for me, I can do it. In spite of people not helping me. In spite of the time of lack and hunger and suffering. I can do it because the Lord strengthens me. Now Jesus was strengthened. Jesus received power when he was uh, in the garden of Gethsemane. That doesn't mean that power was to evade the cross. At... No. He didn't say, okay, the cross will be no more cross for me. It will not be painful for me. That nails would not be painful for me. There would, would be no more piercing. No, they were always painful. They remained painful. The pain was severe. Jesus had to go through such pain. But why? And what happened when the angels gave him strength? What is this strength for? To go through the times of suffering and remain faithful. Say, not my will, but yours be done. And I strongly believe you and I need to have that power. Because in Acts chapter after cha chapter 1, you see a lot of persecutions started happening from 4th chapter. And in all of those, they were standing firm. The same Peter, the same disciples who were running away from problems... Knowing there is a problem ahead, now moving forward. In spite of the problems, they move forward into those uh, places. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit was so strong that it helped them overcome fear and apprehensions. There are so many fears and apprehensions that we have. What if I talk to that person about Jesus Christ? What if I pray for that person? What if I tell them I'm a Christian? What will happen to me? The Holy Spirit will empower you to overcome that and be able to do the will of God. Church was always victorious and will remain victorious. Romans chapter 16 says, And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Revelation also talks about that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he shall rule forever and ever. We cannot de-establish the kingdom of God by our own follies and failures. But what joy it would be if you become part and partner with God is, with what God is doing. And he's calling you, he says, I can do it. I'm self-sufficient, I'm self-reliant. I don't need you, but I want you. Come alongside me. I will empower you. I will be with you and together we will be able to do it. I can't do it on my own, Michael. I created this world in six days. I never needed anybody. And the world was so beautiful. When I gave things in your hand, 
you messed it up badly and the curse came. And that's why you don't take ministry in your hand. You don't take your life in your hand. Let it be in my hand. You partner with me. You listen to me. You obey me. And I will empower you. And the kingdom of God will be established on the face of the earth. Thank you and God bless you.